Okay, so, um, so welcome to today's uh, SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. And today is our latest session on our Taiwan Indigenous, um, uh, Contemporary Indigenous um, uh, lecture series. Uh, we'd like to welcome back uh, Joyce. Yeah, Joyce teaches in the, um, yeah, let me make sure I get it right, Department of Ethnic Relations and Cultures um, in the Indigenous College at National Dohua uh, University in, uh, in, in, in Hualien. Um, she did her PhD in uh, University of Lancaster in uh, sociology, uh, where she focused on um, tourism, but um, she wasn't focused on um, uh, Taiwan's indigenous uh, issues. It's something that she developed as her second PhD that she discussed uh, yesterday. So, so yesterday's talk was quite an anthropological one that looked at uh, Joyce's um, research, but also her, her teaching, and uh, it was very kind of inspirational uh, talk. Uh, today's uh, talk is what um, we've, we've framed as a, a chapter talk. So we, what we're trying to do is to put together a, um, a collection of um, a book chapters that look at issues related to Taiwan's uh, indigenous people that we can use perhaps in a, in a future textbook. Um, um, and okay, on that note then, let's give Joyce a very big um, uh, welcome back to, to Solvents. for coming and also thank you to Soyuz and Davis and Bi Yu to invite me and also Jia Yuan who worked very hard to, to invite to make this event happen. And today actually this talk is going to become a book chapter. So I would what I'm going to talk about will be food and cultural identity. So when I write I probably will not put theoretical stuff. But my talk today was still focused on my uh, research. So I will use kind of case study to share with you. And, and you are welcome to uh, raise any of questions uh, when I talk because personal I like more interactive approach. Yeah, so uh, feel free to raise the questions. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask how many people been to Taiwan? Yes. Okay. And how many people have been to try so-called Taiwanese indigenous food? Okay. Good. We have. Lastly, you have. You have. You definitely have. Okay. Douglas. So, what kind of indigenous food can you remember you have? Yeah. We got more things here. Uh, I don't remember the the names. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of kind of wild uh, vegetables. Wild vegetables, um, yes. So we use um, a lot of river fish. That river we're fish. Heavily salted. And, yeah. Um, I mean, I because I was living, I was living with indigenous people as well, so I was eating a lot of the locally cooked food as well. Yeah, so right, it, right. On the coast, we had like uh, flying fish. Flying yeah, fish. Bamboo, yeah. bamboo shoots that were kind of. Yeah, yeah and sticky rice. Um, yeah, sticky rice, like uh, glutinous rice, mm. batch and uh, snails. Snails, chili, yes. Chili, uh, yeah, yeah. lots of things, yeah. I think you, you're more focused on because it's the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, so you already thank you for providing some background knowledge. Yeah, frying fish, fish, bamboo rice, sticky rice. So here, and my talk is through ethnicity and cultural identity. So staging and performing indigenous through Taiwanese indigenous restaurants and food. Uh, we have a human geography. So because of restaurant, I will talk about some space too. Okay, and then related to how food has performed it. Okay, so here, this is the background about Taiwanese indigenous, indigenous cultures. And, and to, so far, we have 16 recognized tribes. Some people still think Taiwan only have nine tribes because we have this cultural park called Nine Tribes Cultural Park. But you can you can see it's it's growing. It's the growing thing is because it's also kind of separated in some way because for example some of the Ataya tribe and they recognize themselves as as a as a Daluku tribe. So this is coming, and I'm sure very soon we might have another one called Pran Indigenous Pimpuzu. So it will be more, yeah. And But in Taiwan, we have 23 million populations, and only 2% population of indigenous people. 
So you see, it's still very minority in terms of Han Chinese, yeah? But in terms of Taiwanese indigenous uh, people and culture, why it matters? Because it's not only <coughs> Taiwan, it's related to all these Oceanian cultures, yeah? And it's the, the northern, the most northern part. And what I focus is here, uh, I see, uh, yeah, anyway, I focus on the, on the East Coast, yeah. Um, but be before my talk, this is probably helped me to think about the rela important relationship about food. And then some anthropology, some sociology, some uh, even geography. So for example, food as a signifier. Yeah, and, and ident identity builder. So what I'm talking about probably is not really new, but not many people use Taiwanese indigenous uh, food as an uh, identity builder that to make this kind of Taiwanese-ness or indigenous being seen. Okay. And then also Mary Douglas. Mary Douglas used food as a communication, a system of communication. And then this is a communicator, insider and outsider. The different cultures, background, they use food to communi communicate. And uh, Stuart Hall, from the cultural study perspective, this is identity politics. How can we address ourselves as an indigenous people? Yeah. So there's different issues about, especially this. Um, and Stuart Hall, for me, uh, even I regard as myself, some people as regard me as a sociology. And I, I kind of more think my, my research is a, more about cultural studies. It's more cultural study approach to look at food, how food can be an identity, and how these differences can be addressed through all these different issues. And then, geographer. Uh, I also use this kind of critical discourse of cultural landscape. What do we mean by cultural landscape? Yeah. And I don't know if I ask you, what can you represent of England or Britishness? Yeah. And that means you have your Welsh. Mm. Yes. So except the pronunciation, the language, what else can you show to people that my mom is Welsh, so I am Welsh? Mm. Welsh language? Welsh language, yes. Yeah, I think language is probably the, the obvious marker, cultural marker. But also, if I ask you about Welsh food... <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's also difficult in Taiwan because the Taiwan history, we have a lot of migrant, like the history combined with the people immigrant from China. And so here, now you probably... I think the only thing you can tell very clearly is Taiwan bubble tea, right? Taiwan bubble tea, but, but most of the time you hear about Chinese food. You don't hear about Taiwanese food, not to mention about indigenous food. Yeah. And all this kind of food creates something which people actually see, gosh, this is very, well, fish and chips, that's very English, right? Yeah. But we won't consider it's being high class compared with French cuisine. And how, this is all combined with a lot of history. And then we go back to that. And how about indigenous people when they try to make distinction between Han Taiwanese and indigenous people and how they use their food to create this different cultural landscape for people to see the differences. Yeah, okay. And then, James Butler. Well, I like her, yeah, you probably can. And then her concept about, is about gender and how gender has been performed, okay. And I use this concept combined with uh, French verdure uh, about habitus. For me, this performance is not, if you want to be to call yourself as an Amis or indigenous people, you're not saying that, okay, language, you also kind of perform for other people to be recognized. Oh, you are different from Man Taiwanese or, or Han Chinese. Yeah. So this kind of performing it, and I use food, and how food 
or dishes or how space, how this different uh, material culture as a mean to perform who they are. Yeah, so that's kind of performance theory. And material culture are also influenced by um, Abu Dhabi and also Daniel Miller. Is he still somewhere here? Daniel Miller? No? Well, I think his material culture, the concept about material culture, which is also influenced me when I think about food, is a very important uh, material culture for people to, in our everyday life. And that's also to make distinction between you and me, or us and them. Yeah. So it could be become a collective. It's become a collective, but at the same time, it also can be a little bit individual differences because we always have homemade food, which is very my mom, which is different from your mom and my mom's cooking. So food for me is a lot of related to a lot of materiality, memory, or, or narrative, how people address. Yeah. So this is a little bit like theoretical things for people to think. Yeah. And Okay, so uh, uh, IR stands for indigenous restaurant. Yeah. So for me to pick up, <laughs> for me to pick up indigenous restaurant as a and food as a rich uh, research sites or re, uh, research text. Okay, because it's so my approach, as you said, the theory I use is very interdisciplinary which including anthropology and also sociology and geography, etc. But and also it's ethnographic data, which I actually I back to Taiwan since 2004. And I actually start like go to eat the indigenous food. But at that time I didn't thought I'm going to do any research on that. I just walk in and to start to familiar with the people and the food. Yeah. And then I'll tell you more and then I do witness the changes about how they present and how they talk about food. So all this food, the changes also reflected the social changes. Yeah. And how this kind of the related to cultural meanings and how indigenous people performed. And this fish probably doubtless can recognize, right? Fish with salted, yeah. And, and also, um, this is all from like uh, beetle nuts, beetle nuts, trunk, and they make them. <coughs> so, uh, um, and also like eating and drinking, how they practice. And this is also like emotional embodiment. For the people who study here, from China, from overseas, I think food to make you homesick, right? Especially study in UK, which is now famous for their cuisine. Right? So I'm sorry to say that, but it's kind of stereotype also. Yeah. So emotional, and also, especially every festival related to certain food to eat, right? For example, we just have this Dragon Ball Festival, and you eat this kind of rice dumpling, right? And that's all related to maybe make you homesick, and then special festival, or here, Christmas dinner, you eat certain type of turkey or meat, whatever. Yeah. And also how people choose how people choose the food. That's say what they are too. Some people decided to become vegan and because of environmental friendly or their lifestyle, etc. So so it's also show the test. Yeah. And and that's actually very interesting. Some people doing research on what the seems vegetarian or vegan, they are much higher social class compare because not many working class people are vegetarian. So that's kind of interesting related to food choice and, uh, and the lifestyle and the social class. Yeah. And also this is related to this talk, the main issue about talking about identity and how we represent yeah, through food or, and the choices of restaurant and how that can represent who you are. And this paper, I actually, when I did the research, I also interviewed consumers. But this paper is going to be focused on uh, restaurant owners. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, so here, research science and informants. Here, the red part is the east coast of Taiwan, where I did most of my research, yeah. And in Taiwan, there are six indigenous tribes in the east coast. And then most of the population, Amis, the first one, Amis is the most population of indigenous people in Taiwan, yeah. And Amis, yeah, we have Amis here. And so this is the, the two poster, and I choose 12 indigenous restaurants, which I think is only one owner is not indigenous people. But he was the kind of NGO organization, and, and this restaurant now, they are not working anymore, but they have different ways. They use the tool tour, like the people come and join them and doing all this working together. Yeah, and produce their own food. Yeah, and the age is between 40 to 68, and the gender, most of them still, the 12, there's nine, nine owners that are female, and I think that's interesting. Yeah, female as a boss. Yeah, here. And I don't know, is that because in the East Coast, I miss. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, um, in my research, I didn't focus on that part, but I think gender issue would be an interesting topic to talk about is food and identity too. And this is kind of poster I show you, but I'll tell you more. And I do have 22 recorded interviews. So today you will see a lot of, you're going to see a lot of in, uh, interview the quotations. So I use for them to speak for themselves when they talk about why they run the restaurant. And, and of course also informal chat. And this research, I start really start doing serious interviews in 2006. And I'm still going back to the restaurant. And now what I'm doing, sometimes I walk in the kitchen with them. And that's the best way to chat. So I also have some kind of informal chat with all. And also they will ask because they know I'm so-called the expert. So, and so sometimes they will ask for me to try. Well, what do you think? And I give them some idea. So it's become kind of working together, not the own. So I want to reduce this kind of power relationship between the researcher and the research. That's always my, my research ethic and concerns. Yeah. So far, OK? Yeah. So follow me to come to Taiwan in Disney's restaurant. Yeah. So this, as I said, yeah, it's still from 2006. But uh, this. Today I show you is about probably the past about 2006 to 2012, and this is actually mainly to think about where the food come from, and that's how I have the talk yesterday. The continue doing all this, yeah. So this research and I also the in-depth interview. I also have used discourse analysis, how they narrative, and I also collect. The indigenous, uh, each restaurant, if they have a business car, they have poster, they have websites, I also use those, yeah. So the different, the visual, also visual text, I also take the pictures, it's like most of people now, taking picture of food before you eat. So your camera efforts first, yeah. And then sight and signs and cultural symbols, yeah. And how they create and also how the, Atmosphere, how they create this kind of say. If you go to a Thai restaurant, you probably will see. What will you see? If you go to a Thai restaurant, <laughs> what will you see in the oh, restaurant? Yeah, yeah. The decoration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What would you see? Elephant. Elephant. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. You probably will see an elephant and a golden maybe a temple whatever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then for oh. Chinese, <laughs> yes, yeah, and for Chinese restaurant in overseas Chinese restaurant, this lot of restaurant used like a temple light, right? No, no restaurant in Taiwan look like that. But overseas Chinese restaurant will look like a temple, or the ray, or the gold, or the gold, the dragon, something like that. And that's very, very kind of Chinese, you know. And then Taiwanese indigenous restaurant try to make different from those. Like different symbols, and that's also what I focus on, right? Yeah, so this is what I'm talking about cultural landscapes, and I'll show you some images later. So, first, I look at the name <coughs> of the restaurant. So, 12 restaurants, okay, their name. So, they use some of them will use, will say, Amis Indigenous Restaurant. 
so they will tell you they are Amish. Or they will tell you they use collective indigenous identity, say indigenous restaurant, Yuanzhu Min Chan Ting. They will say that. And then uh, some of them will use some of the, the pan, this one I call pan indigenous culture. So they will try to say, at that moment, they wouldn't distinguish their other nation or the tribe. They will use this collective identity. And then also two of them will use their own names. Yeah. And some of names, which actually doesn't mean anything to most of the customers. We will see some examples. Okay. And then some of them, they were like, use so-called like tree house, you know, tree house of the red loop, Hong Wao. That doesn't really link, yeah. But but they have their way to say, oh they will also have tell you it's the local restaurant. Yeah. So we know we come to a Daluku restaurant. And I will ask them how that differ with Ataya restaurant. Mm -hmm. And some of them sometimes they couldn't say, oh just different. But some of them actually come up with a great narrative. Yeah. So yeah, let's see. And this, for example, yeah, they kind of say something like they say Masai. <coughs> Her name is Madaluku tribal name, and it's romanization. And this for Taiwanese, a lot of people don't know like indigenous tribal language. They don't have a written system. They only have an oral. Yeah. And can you come in? Yes. You can see here. There's one as well. Yeah. So it's interesting. She said some thought it was French because oh there's God. a place called Marseille. <laughs> yeah. So they thought it's French cuisine. Yeah. So so but she doesn't know. She said I feel strange until my daughter told me there's a place in French called Marseille. So many Han Taiwanese people don't know that we, that many indigenous people, use romanization to study Bible. Yeah. So actually, if people are interested, I think indigenous and religions is always a very interesting topic, and some people are doing research on that too. There's already some uh, wonderful, interesting research. Yeah. So many indigenous people out there can read Chinese at all. So for this many years, some of them um, I think Douglas for linguistic, you might be interested. Some of the elder, they, they still only speak their tribal language. But some of them are very interesting. They are Mandarin Chinese, even so-called much, much standard than mine. They speak a very, very good Mandarin Chinese. And it's because they went to church every Sunday. Or every, yeah. So here, so it's imagine the exotism oh, and also a means. Okay, then we can see here. Oh, see this is this image to show you because for women, for Taluku women to have a tattoo on their face. This is, so they use, they actually exotic themselves mm -hmm. to fix the stereotype of a Han cultural imagination of Daluku people. But this must say, to, to, that's her name. Yeah. But a lot of Taiwanese doesn't know. And, and, the, and the tourists or the customer, they don't know. But they use Feng Wei Chan. Yeah. And it's kind of favor, indigenous favor. All this Feng Wei Chan. And the interesting things or we will talk about later, there's a lot of issue. Because even we now have 16 tribes. A lot of indigenous, this kind of indigenous favor or taste and the, and, and the meal, they almost look the same. Mm. Well, later I'll show you because it's become a set meal. And Taiwan is very small. So food travel, people travel. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting topic. So this is naming indigenous. They use the name to tell people um, different from this kind of Han Chinese restaurant. Okay. But People only see this, see they are indigenous. Otherwise, and, and this, and here they say Daluku tribe. Yeah, to make that so naming. And unfortunately, this this poster has been damaged by typhoon a couple of years ago. But she's going to re re to make that again. Yeah. But this for Daluku people, 
for a tattoo woman to put it here is actually very interesting. So for visual cultural analysis, there's a lot of this image said a lot. Yeah, so if you are interested, and I, uh, we have a lot of food study students here. Study food, and I think image, you need to have a visual culture, yeah, and you need to have certain skill to talk about that, yeah. So, and then, so also, it's a indigenous food or restaurant could be an economic resource, resource for them, yeah. And a lot of people, they are not intended to run a restaurant at the beginning. It's because they run a guest house and people want food. So let's start invite them to come and eat with them. And then there's gradually some guests suggest us to sell food too. So this kind of capitalism may start kind of invade into this indigenous society. Yeah. And then we do it and give us more income. So sim simple reason just want to make more money. So some of them is economic resources. Yeah, and see, and then we cultural center. This is the guy who, they, they actually is a cultural center. And then they said, we didn't provide me at the beginning, but they did, uh, uh, let's get, oh, I forgot, but indigenous food, indigenous food, IF, <laughs> indigenous food, is <laughs> is getting popular. So we followed the flow and have started selling indigenous food. We went to test the indigenous, the other indigenous food. So, copy, learning, learning to be indigenous. It's actually very interesting, you know, yeah. And then, uh, then we create our own specialty, and we are more just exhibit those cultural items. And then start putting something to make the atmosphere more like indigenous restaurant, yeah. So the culture is learned. Yeah. So tourism in some way, sometimes uh, it's just, it's like it can bring the dead culture back. Yeah. And of course it could be destroy the place too. Yeah. And indigenous food is an educational tour. And then some indigenous restaurant, this is the Amis, and they will tell you, yeah, yeah. Now I hope that's me, how are you? So you are not come to, come to conserve the food you also have a chance for you to learn the basic culture. And that is also a selling point for the restaurant. And also, this restaurant, both owners are retired teachers. So they know, they got a plenty of knowledge about indigenous plants, indigenous, how they use the wild vegetables. And they will put, they will grow, they make their uh, in, uh, restaurant outside the garden. It's like a herb garden or edible garden. And then they will put aside to introduce people the plants and how they use that. So it's become like you went to a garden center and then to learn how to use this plant. So they said, we are doing a cultural education for our living ecology and we are pleased to share our Amis culture to our guests. We grow all the indigenous tree and plants so that people can see and touch our culture. See and touch, use different senses. Yeah, for people, it's not only to consume the food into their body, but also different senses, smell, touch, and that's this kind of embodiment, embodied experience for people to like embody our culture as well. So they have, so for this, probably because they are teachers, so they have this kind of intention of education, and through that, people would know about Amis culture. Yeah. So it's not the restaurant, it's not only the restaurant for them, it's an educational platform for people to understand Amis culture. Yeah. Okay? It's also an intellectual platform, and as a content zone, yeah, this is very post-colonial concept about content zone. But for this, yeah, they say, yeah, to me, indigenous restaurants never just a place to sell food. I hope through the indigenous food, people can respect our indigenous cultures. Uh, indigenous people are not people who can drink, sing, dance, and know how we play basketball only. They have many good values in our culture that hand over this can learn from us. I hope the customer can get some ideas of our ways of living. 
So here, use the restroom in order to break the stereotype for indigenous people. So they have a very strong intention of what the restaurant can offer. Yeah. And that's to me is interesting. And I have to say, when I start my research at the beginning when I talk and chat with them, it surprised me because they all they are such a way uh, know how to say things and then to share. And that's how it get to me to know, gosh, I want to, to get this more things done. Yeah for people really to understand. So it's not only a, a, a restaurant for people to eat food. They got more way. And for me, so this is kind of eating matters. And eat, eat. restaurant can be, uh, with the food can be a weapon for them to, that's my one of the arguments of this paper. Food can be an indigenous cultural weapon for them to take back their cultural rights. Yeah. So see, and I think indigenous restaurants give them a chance to contact with our culture, yeah? See, this is a cultural weapon, fighting position, and the other strikes back. Yeah, I think for, for some in, uh, anthropologists, you know Joy Henry, who did the research on Japan, and then she was uh, really do a lot, of, and one of the things is that the Orient strikes back. I highly recommend that book. Yeah. It's not only talk about food, it's also talking about how this kind of Asian culture, uh, how this back to this and uh, com compete with this Western society. Uh, and best she focused on Japan. So this is um, um, so we use indigenous food to talk back to Han Chinese people, Taiwanese people. Yeah. Food can be used as a weapon which is like doing a social movement of uh, being involved with many, many indigenous environmental and social movements, but the result have been disappointing. When I return to Hualia and work together with my own community, I gradually gain a sense of subjectivity. I have realized that if our own responsibility to pass the culture, speak the truth, the museum and that culture, which won't help the indigenous people at all. However, indigenous restaurants give job opportunity to our people. We also cherish our culture more because of indigenous restaurants. Yeah. This is actually for me, when I was interviewed and heard about this, it's, it's hit my heart actually. Yeah. And I said to myself, I definitely have to write down this. And if you can read Chinese, I'm happy to send you my uh, Chinese paper. I do have a Chinese paper on similar like this, so if you're interested. And yeah, and I also have continued research about talking about this kind of tourism as a special event and this everyday life, this extraordinary and everyday life. And what in everyday life, what indigenous people they do eat in their everyday life if you're interested. And this culture as a weapon and fighting position and the other strikes back. Yeah, I have more so far, but I is that can you follow it or any questions? Yes. Yeah, and this is probably not only for Taiwanese indigenous people. When I travel, I also notice a lot of like so-called indigenous minority. They they will use different things, even material culture. For example, the dress, the clothes, yeah, the music, the dance, yeah. Yes? One well, quick question. Uh, so, uh, are um, Han people or, or mm. coming and copying these restaurants and are there any pretenders, people coming in and pretending to be? Yes. Uh, because it's very popular with tourists. Yeah, but then, yeah, some of the, in, in, especially in East Coast, like a uh, five star hotel, there's one in indigenous uh, in Taluku National Park, there's a five star hotel, they also offer indigenous <coughs> food. But some people, but they don't have that, you know. I will talk about later because who cook the food is important. Mm -hmm. And grows it. Yeah, well, are you indigenous people? If you're not, that's a little bit different. So I'm, I'm meaning appropriation, I guess, but for commercial mm -hmm. yes. purposes. Yeah. Well, I think you related to this authenticity. Issue also, also, authenticity is very important too. But for me, my research, after my, my research in tourism, 
I, I already don't talk about authenticity because everything in tourism context, under that context, is, is performance. So I use performance idea rather than authenticity. Yeah. But that's debatable. You can, you can. And then Wang Bing in China, China scholar, he have a, a paper called Rethink Authenticity and address the issue about authenticity in tourism context. Yeah. So if you are interested, and I just attend a, actually another talk in China in May. He now talking about freshness. He used freshness, and I think that's a brilliant, interesting idea talking about. Because also indigenous food in Taiwan, they will use this concept. It's very fresh because we just pick up this morning. Yeah. And then it's fresh, we just caught that in the river or from the sea. Yeah, so so I think that's kind of interesting connected. Yeah. Any more questions? Could I just ask about yes. your, your definition of an indigenous restaurant? Yes. Yes. Because um, yes. uh, you mentioned that some of the owners are Han. No, uh, oh, yeah, in this no, research, only one. yeah, only one, and the reason I, I include in his is because he worked in a cultural center, in uh -huh. a, a Galuga okay. cultural center, which he's actually, like me, even I'm Han Chinese, right, but I become, I'm not say fake, but I'm, I'm kind of indigenous people regard as indigenous studies yeah right. and he okay. is the one who's been working with indigenous people for over 20 years mm -hmm. and their cultural center run this kind of uh, kind of cafe for for people that's why i include him yeah but my you the good question because in this study there's many restaurants right and when i identify as indigenous restaurant the owner have to be indigenous and then also themselves have to think they are indigenous restaurants. Mm -hmm. Because some people will say, oh, we are not only selling indigenous food, we are just restaurants. And then they, that's not the thing I'm talking about. And also, I also exclusive those one in the, the hotel. In East Coast, a lot of <coughs> hotel, you can have indigenous flavor from Wei Chan too. That's <coughs> not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, just uh, my question originally was uh, how did you select a hotel? Uh, restaurant, but you just gave yeah, it that's time. also because after I, I think when you know when I back to Taiwan, I will teach at Donghua. I have so many visitors, including Leslie. Yeah, so I have friends come to Taiwan to visit me, or my family come to East Coast to visit me, and I don't want them to have this Italian food or Beijing food. I want them to experience this kind of indigenous food, which is different. So and then gradually, you know, I I have all this. And then, and then I kind of fell down and choose these twelve. Yeah. Okay. I will write about why I choose them. Yeah. But <coughs> I'm not detailed in this. Yeah. And then also indigenous as a tourist experience. Yeah. So this is actually the the one who provides. So let's say my husband and I are retired teachers. Yeah. So they want to have for people that experience indigenous through food as a different tourist experience, yeah? And then also, since I'm an indigenous myself and I have tourists, I always cook indigenous food for my friend and gradually become a career, yeah? So they, a lot of them is gradually, because indigenous people have this kind of share culture. They will, they will invite you to come. Maybe Douglas know when you were doing your field work, they will come and join us, come and join us and have this hospitality. So, so they gradually become, so it's great to see people are having a good time and visiting and eating our food. Yeah. So, so indigenous food as a consuming geography too. It surprised me in Taiwan, even it's a small island, you can travel the whole island in one day. And there's still so many people haven't been to Hualien. So Hualien is a place for people to think, they say it's a back mountain, it's like Ho Shan, or it's a, the last pure land in Taiwan, because it's the last industrial area. And they also have this some of them have romanticized about Hualien because, uh, and also now because the air pollution in the west coast and Hualien, the fresh air, actually it's not, yeah, and then the mountain, the water, the landscape, 
this attract a lot of people. So see, many tourists told me that eating indigenous meal is one of the authentic experience of visiting Hualien. So when they come to Hualien, they want something different. And then indigenous food for them is this. And then it helped them to collect their experience of visiting Hualien. And then we displace our vegetables on the counter so people can take many pictures as they want. Yeah. So they know what tourists want. And so this kind of vegetable will bring back freshness of Hualien now that you can get the type A. But actually now indigenous you can have in the so-called indigenous vegetables, especially wild vegetables, you can buy that in the West Coast because we have this kind of e-shopping and people try to help indigenous, yeah. But to eat, because it's like you can have a fish and chips everywhere, but for people to eat in England, especially in London or somewhere in the coast, would be their freshness or Englishness experience, yeah. So indigenous and healthy food. This is a healthy related to nature. Related to have the discourse of healthy is also very important. Yeah. And then for, for now we know with all this organic food and all this and indigenous people seems yeah, see we eat very simple. They also use they use imply also this discourse of nature, discourse of nature uh, and healthy too. So everything is direct on nature and it's very healthy. And we eat a lot of fish and seafood. I think we are much healthier than those who eat so much meat. Since we pick up wild vegetables from nature, yeah, it doesn't contain chemicals. So they also have this discourse. But if you use the, the right expectancy, indigenous people are now living longer than Han Taiwanese. But this discourse, people seem to accept. Never doubt. Yeah, OK. So, but the healthy food, indigenous is a healthy food. And of course, lifestyle, performing nature, and the traditional ecology knowledge. Yeah, I miss people. They, they will say, I miss people eat mountain and sea. Shanghai, they eat Shanghai. And men go fishing, and women go pick up wild vegetables. We eat everything. Yeah, I miss people to eat everything. They have a, they're saying, and, and I think Dr. say you mentioned about snails. And snail is um, a miss specialty, and a special way of preparing it. And you pick up and then you let them put it in the cage for a few days so they will come out with all this. So it's actually, so they will say it's very natural and no problem at all. Yeah. Then they will say nature belongs to anyone and it's our fridge too. Our culture is to share. So this is a concept about the indigenous culture. And then, especially Amish people, they always say like the ocean. Mountain, field, it's their fridge. Yeah, yeah, so this kind of concept. <coughs> yep. Um, yeah, and they will use some material culture, for example, bamboo, stone, whatever, to make their create this sense of atmosphere of indigenous. I'll show you the, and then use a banana leaf, whatever. i show you some pictures. Yeah, like this. They even put a wire ball, the wire pig, the ball, into this kind of concept for people to feel, oh, it's, 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 it's real. And this is mainland, yeah. And, and this is actually kind of Han uh, farming tour, but they will put that to increase this kind of nature, yeah, atmosphere. It's at, very artificial, but then, yeah. yeah. I think that's the duck, right? Yeah, and then here. Also, they use the art, yeah. By the way, this is banana. If you never see a real banana grow in the trees, yeah. Okay, so, and they use a lot of banana leaf to, as a plate, yeah, use from the nature. And then I miss the carving. And that, you probably see it's very, it doesn't look like Taiwanese indigenous. The painting is, you know, so when I ask them, they say, oh, they want to have a beautiful woman, and a beautiful woman for them, the standard is from Western. So they <laughs> kind of draw in this. So this kind of safe, yeah. And actually, I told them that this is problematic. It doesn't, 
And I think now they repent. Oh, yeah, they do repent. And so this is kind of it. And they use a lot of coughing too. A lot of coughing, food coughing. Yeah, and this, yeah. This is Amis, traditional Amis costumes. Yeah, you can wear this in taking pictures. Some of the restaurants, yeah. yeah. To let you feel like you are part of them. Yeah. And let's see, you can see bamboo is probably the most used for a lot of decorations. To make that is sense of nature. This restaurant still near the Liyue Lake, and they still run the business, still going very well. And this is stone. Fuding, fuding is Amish fish. Yeah, so they use fuding, the Chinese character, fish here, and and all this bamboo. And then because of typhoon, yeah, sometimes they damage it, and then bamboo is easy to rebuild. Yeah, so they use the material to. This kind of sense of nature, yeah, create this kind of nature even in a city or in a restaurant, in a, yeah. So exoticism for tourists, a cultural image, right? So for some, some tourists, it's an indigenous re restaurant. And I also, because I work with them, sometimes I was there interview and then there's some, uh, there's some customer will come. And you will see the tourists or customers will say, wow, it's really different. But actually, it's, it's, it's not much different, but I don't know what that in the setting. Yeah, see, they say, most of the Han Taiwanese tourists want something exotic and different. So the presentation is important, and as long as it looks different and exotic, then they think they are eating authentic indigenous food. Most of the dishes in the restaurants are not the way we eat at home. We eat very simple and are beautifully displayed like that at home. So they actually have, a, they have, they know that it's the conscious that it's performers. They are not like they eat at home because it's simple. But when they present to uh, to tourists or to the customers, they know how to display things beautifully. Yeah, and this is. So is this authentic? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's performance, right? Yes. So here. And see, this is from north to south, from east to coast. If you go to a lot of indigenous restaurants, you definitely, definitely will have this barbecue pork everywhere. You can have uh, this salty fish covered with uh, with uh, salt, heavy salt, and then you barbecue it, and then you take out that, that skin out. Yeah. So you can have that too. You can have that in Alishan, you can have that in uh, Daluku National Park. Yeah. And then some of them will set that kind of set meal. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's become, you don't really see the difference, but then when you interview them, they've got their story to talk about. They have their own narrations. They have their uh, uh, discourse, and that's far end. That's the uh, Chinavu I was talking about, and it's very similar like a Chinese uh, rice dumpling, like a zhongzi, yeah, a Chinavu. And this is a fresh fish, yeah. So now with this kind of uh, become unified, what I call like, like standardized. standardized, yeah, standardized food, indigenous food. Now people also realize that. So now they start come out with something which more like do it yourself mm -hmm. for you to experience. You make this, you put the salt on the fish. So it's not really the dishes, it's the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this in, in, in tourism, this experience uh, tourism. It's, it's now a train. So people not want to be, just do nothing. They want to engage. And, and the more they can engage, the more authenticity <coughs> they experience they feel. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is just to give you some. And see here, it's bamboo. Again, use this so-called nature. And then the display, normally they use the fresh things yeah, to, to show to other people. Yeah. And perform indigenous by others. Also, they will use, except that they also use media. And now, now Facebook, when I did my uh, star research, is, Facebook is not popular yet. Yeah, but they use media. They use abilities. 
and they will put a newspaper if they have a big report, they will put on a newspaper or the president, the former president has been visit them and they will show the pictures. So I'll show you some. And then probably people don't know Jackie Wu, Wu Zhongxian. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, in Taiwan, probably everybody know him. Yeah, yeah so, so, so the picture with uh, Jackie Wu will be one of the, uh, one of the ad, 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 uh, advertisement for the restaurant. Yeah, so, yeah, and a TV program, see this. And then there's also certificate to see, you will get the, the first, uh, the number one prize for this indigenous to show you. And there's some famous scholar, which we probably don't know, but they have their name. It's from Harvard University in America, so a famous university. And then some like a stability, and they will, a lot of indigenous restaurants also have a wall like that, yeah. So that's show that how good their restaurant. So they use the other markers of their indigenous. <coughs> yeah. yeah, and stereotype also. This is very interesting. This is saying, so they also know, most of lot of Taiwanese, they have no idea about indigenous food. So they say, whatever, they don't understand our culture, so whatever we fit them, they eat. <laughs> and anyway, as long as they see our dark skin, they thought we are authentic indigenous people. This is the the, the never the interview when they say that. So so they sometimes they hire people from Thailand work with them because they are <laughs> and they once yes yeah and they put. They probably put a uh, west, and it look like indigenous people. Nobody will doubt, because you have no idea. It's horrible. It's horrible, yes, but it's business. It's business. It's business. It's business. It's it's yeah, it's a business. It's business. It's business. It's business. <laughs> and it's a globalization. Yeah, to be fair, how many yeah. Japanese restaurants have been in London with oh. a <laughs> Yes. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Yes. Yeah. So okay. this is um. And then see, this is even worse. Some travel agents will say, why you put the indigenous clothes just for, the, for their tourists so they can take pictures? Yeah, I'll show you some pictures here. See, this is Zhang Chuan. His wife actually is from Hong Kong. And once you put the Amis clothes, you are Amis. Yeah. So this is actually very post-colonial, if we think the dark skin uh, or the black mask, whatever, but no. Yeah, this is, once you perform the thing, it just, all this materiality, she's original from Hong Kong. And now, because he, her husband is Amit, and, and, and she know much better now, because she's introduced the thing. Yeah, and I can tell from her accent. So I said, where are you from? And she said, actually, because I've become friends, she said, oh, get this so oh, I told you quietly, I'm from Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but when she dressed like that, I can't tell. Yeah, it's only from her accent I can tell that she's from Hong Kong. But from what she wear that, you know, so it's actually, that's why I abandoned the concept about authenticity. To me, it's performance. It's her performativity. Yeah, and this is some means. Yeah, I know actually this lady, I, I knew them. But this is Amis, and this is Lan Yu, this is Da Wu's boat. And we put that on the train all together. So, all this, yeah. And this is our government to promote our tourism. Yeah. So this is what I talked about in and see if you can reach our needs here, Hualien. That's the site. Yeah. I was very proud of these pictures. Yeah. yeah. And you can see more. We have Hello Kitty train. Yeah. So this is the, the, the concept about government try to promote and I think this QT, this kawaii culture. Yeah, and before there was time because indigenous people, they use indigenous people to mark the difference of attraction, right? Yeah.
and say, yeah, this is more exotic. <laughs> yeah. With banana, but the face and the clothes. And this is a facial tattoo. This is all the picture I took from the indigenous restaurant. And and, and, as a, and, and this, this is kind of Dao. This is, and see, they also offer like in the in-flight magazine that introduced the restaurant. So that's become, and this is all again, people as a <coughs> cultural objects. Yeah, so for me to show, so called, this, this lady lived up to 104. Yeah, and it's interesting when people interview her, what is she, you are sick with a long life. She have a cigarette here. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. And unfortunately, she passed away. But she has a she she has a tattoo. That means she's a good weaver. She she needs to know really good. And she have this. That means she is really really um, uh, a high tech technique. Yeah, and that is. They, they changed that because I, I, I talked to them, I, I said, this is really, I don't feel comfortable, this, yeah. And I think that's because her husband liked this Western style woman. <laughs> from, yeah, from hair, remember, from hair. Yeah. That's fixed his own fantasy. Yeah, that's big food. Okay, so here, it is a few influences. So I'm, I'm going to summarize here. Indigenous, this is indigenous food in tourism. Of course, that's per more link. It's always to link with indigenous tourism. And this is also <coughs> kind of promoting cultural industries. And now they try to do more creative industry, like Chuang Yi Chan Ye, combined with something which, which like this, this is an artist, and then um, they make different things, yeah. And the organic and health indigenous is also arguments, right? Yeah, in some way, they're kind of self-presenting themselves as other, which is different from main Taiwanese. So this kind of self-othering, I think it's also very important issues too. I did criticize a bit of this, yeah. But as a business strategy, if it works, then it works, right? Yeah. So uh, indigenous culture as a foreign culture, is often food. It's still, for most of the tourists, it's like that. So they want to test, they want to experience this difference, yeah. And eating is political act, yes. For some people, yes, to consume, and, and when Taiwan the political situation is like the people who support Taiwan independence, uh, they don't go to so-called Beijing restaurant, Sichuan restaurant. They will go to Thai, Taiwan Thai Thai, Taiwan Taiwanese restaurant, and also they go for the indigenous restaurant. Yeah, so they, they don't go to this kind of yeah, the the Han Thai Chinese food. Yeah, and of course. Uh, for Taiwan, for indigenous restaurant become popular. That's also related to this all the global trend about the slow food movement. Yeah, this slow life, slow eating, because it takes time. For example, the barbecue. For example, the fish. It took ages. It took time for them to prepare. So it's all linked with these people. Um, and it's fixed also a lot of. Uh, people from Taipei, from West Coast to, ta to East Coast, they think Taiwan, the Hawaiian is slow. So they want to experience this kind of slowness. Yeah. And food, as I said, food can be a weapon to get the right of interpreting their own culture and their own cultural identity too. Yeah. And performing indigenous. Yeah, there's so many things, vegetable, animals, uh, mineral, wine, 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 sorry, master. And then bamboo sticky rice, etc. Yeah, and food presentation and ways of cooking. Yes, and burn, uh, there's a burning rock like this. Yeah, so this is kind of set meal, right? Yeah, and now, see, you can tell if you can read Chinese, this talking also about cocktail. Yeah, use meme and wine to make a cocktail, and that's also fix a lot of people's fantasy. Yeah, and then. Some all these restaurants still are very popular in Hualien. Yeah. Yeah. Floating. And the sign for me, also the issue about hybridity. 
uh, I'm interested in this, and the culture. It's not, for me, all the culture is kind of mingled together nowadays, even indigenous culture too. So you take a bit of this, a bit of that. And, and the popular indigenous restaurant in Taiwan, from my observation, those owners have the trend for the Western style. They've been working in other restaurants. And they come by with this creativity uh, from their traditional food and make that sense of beauty. And that makes their restaurant become so popular. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and then food in action as a strategy, opportunity, and performing this kind of cultural meaning. And of course, it's a tourist attraction. And it's also help them the cultural survival. And then we turn this uniqueness and intercultural communication. And a lot of restaurants, because they display all the different ingredients, material, or the objects. So it's become like a living museum. People can really see, touch, smell, and then eat. So they experience the, the something which they, they like experience like a museum-like. And of course, it's very expressive cultures. And for Taiwanese indigenous restaurant, it's also very uh, interesting to see. One is kind of pan-indigenous, this collective identity. And then sometimes they also use their in, in, individuality, like, oh, I'm from Bunong. So this Bunong, the way we barbecue is different from Amish people. Yeah. But they also like, like rock, rice, and power, indigenous eating culture, and how they practice. Yeah. And in terms of barbecue, Bunongs and, and in Zhou Zhu, in Alisan, the Zhou tribe, they get different. And they will come up with all their way how it's different. Yeah. And food in action as a side of or all here, it's a different summary. It could be a distinction, distinction you and uh, them and us, okay? Or it's also image making, self definition, cultural maker, yeah, and, and also a sense of belonging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all this, all this, I think this is also related to all the food, if you're interested, all these issues like. Identity marker and discursive space or identi identity politics, yeah. And of course, performing ethnicity or this kind of anti stereotype or enforced stereotype, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Bon appetit, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank, thanks, Joyce. This um, was like, again another fascinating uh, talk, and I've got loads of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of questions. But let me just kind of start with maybe um, well, one I was particularly mm -hmm. uh, curious about, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's about the owners of these restaurants. Um, about um, what, sorry? The owners of the restaurants. The owner, okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about their kind of life stories? How did they end up um, uh, running these kind of restaurants? Yeah. You mentioned. Um, one case where you've got two retired teachers. Yes. You mentioned another one who maybe has been involved in social movements. Yes. Uh, to what extent are these um, university graduates who uh, lived in the big cities and then decided to come back? Can you talk, just talk a little bit about yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, uh, the owner of the restaurant actually, for this 12 restaurant, I think there's two retired teachers, mm -hmm. right? And there's also other retired teachers. So they also have this cultural capital. Yeah, in, in terms to turn the restaurant into a, a place for people to learn their cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, at that time when I do the research, none of, except these three, none of them have a college degree. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. let me put it this way. And you are very interested to notice that nowadays, because I've been doing following up on this, yeah, and we have more, actually, I, I also, after this research, in, in Hualien, in East Coast, there are more indigenous restaurants. And you're right, they are run by college graduates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, they are, they are now, for some of them, they're really being, for, for me, uh, back to here first, the owners of restaurants in, in my study, some of them have been there working in the city. Mm -hmm. And then because the parents are sick, so they have to move back to the village. And that's how they start with the restaurant. And some of them, as I say, that some of them they never have a experience of running a restaurant, or they are not intention want to be 
but because they are guest house and people want the food. So gradually, they start cook. And people think, oh, you cook really well, and they get more confidence. And also, it's, it's, it's a good income. So gradually, they do that. And you, it's very interesting for you, because I want to follow up about the point, the difference, and in terms of their, like their education background. Now we have a higher and higher, we, I have an MS student who graduated and go back to her village, and now she runs a restaurant. But her restaurant is also, it's combination with also cultural learning center. And the people, is, she's not only cook for them, but their food is interesting, like her food now, she's selling bread, they make a lot of pizza now. Pizza, because pizza often become a, 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 a there was time it become very popular. And this is a pizza oven is normally put in outside. So for indigenous people, fix their lifestyle. So the pizza, it's become, the pizza never been, how come it's linked with indigenous people? And also bread making, we have a lot of like, not much, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're selling bread, yeah. And people never doubt about indigenous people. And I've been worried about this because I'm also doing research on North American Indian. And I know they become diabetes. It's because they eat so many bread. <laughs> so I keep warning them, you know, this is, and this is the bread eating is never be indigenous people or Han Taiwanese, whatever. And this is kind of Western influence of food. So the, when I did my research on that 12 interview, I, I can tell they are, it's like, it's because tourism, because East Coast, a lot of people want to go and they need to eat, so they end up like that. Okay, okay uh, that was, this kind of follows on from what you said. I don't know if it was a question or a comment really, yeah. um, but there wasn't, I know that you were focused mainly about kind of performance. Yeah. Uh, and not about authenticity, which is something I don't really want to touch on too much, but I think it's important to talk about it in terms of, there wasn't a lot of discussion about defining what is, what makes cuisine indigenous. Mm. And it seems like there's, I mean, you could discuss the, the type of ingredients, where it, whether it be wild boar, or yeah. snails, yeah. or whatever, then down to the modes of collection, hunting, mm. using traditional methods, yeah. um, seasonal, you know, yes. um, I mean, fishing festivals, you know, where, where they, yeah. they, they, there, are, there are certain times of the year that they, that they collect certain types right, of right, right. Uh, and, and the, 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 the tools that they use to collect them traditionally. Yeah. And then you move on to the method of preparation, so yeah. salting versus yeah. grilling versus whatever. <laughs> um, remember, this is, what, <laughs> I went to visit this Amis village once, and the guy said, oh, we're going to make a traditional Amis chicken. And we were like, oh, okay. And he got, he put a chicken, not like a live one, he put like a, you know, like a plucked and feathered chicken into a metal box and yes. covered it in hay and petrol and just set it on fire. Oh. And it just cooked the chicken inside this burning hot box for like 15 minutes or something and took it out. And everyone had chicken. But uh, I wouldn't say that's traditional, but it, you know, they, they use this kind of the way of, of cooking it to kind of show that they have something that's a bit different, but whether or not obviously that's not traditional. But, uh, and then we'll be on to kind of things like table etiquette, um, yeah. drinking habits, yeah. um, songs like that. So it seems to me there's, there's a lot of the process from start to finish. You could talk about many different ways to define yes. uh, indigeneity. But that wasn't really discussed in the talk. I mean, that wasn't the focus of the talk. But um, you know, for me, it, it, it's it's less to do with who's actually running the business or yes. doing that, and more to do with the with the entire process of. Yeah, you're right. I think in my paper, I actually write in that the the one who own the restaurants, they got the right to interpret the culture. So there's so many ways to say. It. So that's why I use a lot of their narratives because I let them to define, they define the indigenous restaurant or indigenous food. Yeah. And it's not me to define. And then I will say I focus on certain aspects. So each restaurant, I will focus the same aspect. For example, the poster, and then that's why something I can compare or I can analysis, you know. And you're right, there's so many things. And that's why I say food study is so interesting. 
because they come from so many different aspects. Yeah. And so in one, like you say, you're also talking about how to drink, you know, and they will come out, the, the indigenous owner will come and say, oh, this is how we drink. And for some indigenous people, you have to drink in one go, and all you share, you share a whole board of drinks together. Yeah, and then before you drink, you you, you share with the, the spirit, the God, the earth, so the ritual. And this is how the different from in the big stop, bus stop, big hotels. There's something they don't have. And then the way for them to able to share the stories, to tell you. So for indigenous owner themselves, normally for this 12 restaurant, it's interesting because they all come out. Nobody chef or cook, they are behind stage. When we're talking about stage, we're talking about this government stuff, that front, back, front stage or backstage, right? And nobody chef is in the backstage, only the dishes. <coughs> but indigenous restaurant, there's always somebody, either the owner or the owner's partner, they will tell you the story. And that's the story make their dishes authentic. Yeah. I don't know whether I answer your questions. Yeah. It wasn't really a question. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, just uh, to share with you. So sure. I did, I know when I start writing this paper, there's so many things. And I just think, how can I focus about, so I use staging and performance mm -hmm. to, to become my focus. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, the first one is quite theoretical. Uh, this concerns with the issue of adopting Western theories. So your uh, your case study is very local, yeah. indigenous, indigenous yeah. restaurants, but your theoretical framework are heavily drawn from Western theories. Yeah. So I wonder, like, how you deal with the challenges that you might encounter in yeah. doing this. And the second question is more like I would like to learn more about your opinion on uh, how we can evaluate these performances, like how subversive these performances are, because on the one hand we see uh, in your summary you describe uh, running indigenous restaurants as cultural weapon, but on, on the other hand we see how the state or the mass media can appropriate these indigenous stereotypes and meanings. So that's um, more like... Yeah, thank you for the questions. I think um, we always, always, especially like um, if we use so-called Western theory or we use any theory, there's always a problem like how do you appropriate, you use, how do you use the theory to, to your case studies? And I think there's nothing to do with so-called local cast. Anyone who uses other people's theory, you always have to address that. Yeah. And I think for me is to think about whether when I use this concept about, uh, for example, distinction from peer Boudoir, the distinction, and then do I really use it well? And can I convince the audience? Yeah. And I think that's my concern. Yeah. So whether I use it appropriate or not, I let the audience to judge, yeah. And and when I say that to my student, I always say, you have to convince me whether you use it okay or just just the name, or you really you, you really understand the theory and then how you use the case to elaborate or to as to convince your audience. Yeah, that's the first question. And how do I how do I kind of judge the performance? I don't. I just use the case and then to to address the issue. And so it could be a strategy or it could be a tactic, the way they try to perform them, perform themselves and then use different. And I just show the my analysis for people whether am I convincing you as an audience or not. Yeah. So yes. Can you add Yes. Uh, one thing is that because my research is about the indigenous music, music, and I found one thing. I think it, the, it's the same as your topic, like uh, the government policies. They use uh, like join the festival to yes. present the indigenous yes. culture, right? And sometimes they're just using like amazing music, but uh, put on dance, something yes. like that. Yes. So I think sometimes the policies need to be correct. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately. Right. Yes. So that's one comment. 
But the other things like about the identity, yeah. uh, because my research is uh, focused on uh, in, uh, contemporary indigenous music on social media things. Yeah. I think the, the identity needs to be rethink yeah. because we got some collective identity yeah. and the in individual identity as well. Right, right. Like I'm a miss, but yeah. I'm indigenous uh, to be compared with the Han Chai, right. Han Taiwanese, right? So I want to know what's your perspective about the interaction between the yes. individual identity and the collective identity. Yeah, thank you thank for the you. good questions. Yes, for in terms of this government policies, yes, especially tourism, it's more related to also more tourism, especially the government try to promote Taiwanese indigenous tourism. Yes. And there's a lot of kind of policies, like they will now, we will help you to, uh, uh, like now the farming things, Agriculture is yes. very, very popular now for people, tech people, tech tour, tourists go to the farm to experience this. So the government policy is always is a big like the the the, the way to to lead to lead this kind of indigenous the art development, like you said music. And you are right, so I, I use the hybridity. Mm. And then this kind of hybridity also interesting. Sometimes you never know sometimes this kind of pan indigenous or collective identity. But sometimes they will say, if for example, Sumin, you will know, like he will use the Amis identity, but then he also used Dulan, because then Dulan is different, even they are Amis, but they are Dulan Amis. And this Dulan Amis is very different from Hualian Amis. Yeah, so so Sumin's Sumin's I think you probably if you're going to study contemporary indigenous music. You well, I think Sumin would be should be included. Yeah, and this, I think his case would be interesting when he used this kind of collective Amis or indigenous, Taiwanese indigenous, and then Amis and then Dula. And sometimes Dula is very highlight because this Sumin's music festival in November. So if everybody well interested, that's that's really interesting <coughs> about Sumin's what Sumin was doing. Yeah, he was he, he reacted to the government policy, tourism policy, but he turned into his own way of organizing all this music festival, which people have to become armies. So you have this fact and then singing and dancing and all the local local um, art, artifacts is run by uh, Dulan. So, but he also sometimes uses armies. This armies festival, but it's Dulan. Yeah. So I, I'm not so sure. I I hope this is give you some kind of thoughts. And in, in terms of identity, for me, I think um, I never I never think we are kind of pure mm -hmm. identity. And myself as a half bright, half bright, yeah, and Taiwanese and Han Chinese and this, for me it's like, but it's interesting when people when they claim themselves or oh, are Puno. And then sometimes they say, oh, I'm Taiwanese indigenous people. Yeah. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the, yeah. uh, the customers in these mm -hmm. uh, restaurants? Mm -hmm. uh, so who are they? Uh, is the main target yeah. uh, Taiwanese or... Um, um, tourists. Overseas tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what about mainland Chinese yes, uh, tourists? Yeah. Well, actually... Um, at the beginning, because when I started my research, like 2006, mm -hmm. at that time there are not many Mandarin, uh, uh, the Chinese tourists. Yeah. yeah. But in 2000, I think 2000 and start 2008, they graduate, and, and then especially 2000, like 10, when Ma Ying-jeou was yeah. as a president, that the, the policy was open. So Hualien, even. I have a difficult time to get a ticket, try to take it back to visit my mom because it's all for tourists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then that's why because Chinese tourists they come on a big tourist bus and their pre presentation will be different and they always have dance. Ah, okay. Because that's what many the Chinese tourists want to see. Mm -hmm. It's always combined with dance. And that's how you will have this Thai lady or Vietnamese lady walk in the restaurant to serve them and the Chinese tourists have no idea they are not Taiwanese at all. 
Yeah. So did some of the restaurants you looked at yeah. deal with Chinese tour groups? Yeah, they do. Okay. They do. And, and I think there's one called San Fang Yang Si. They, they are talking because they can accommodate a huge. Uh, they can have about five tour, touring bus. Because their restaurant, they kind of open the way the other place. So they can have this big table, about 12 or 10. Table one table, they can have, they can accommodate that huge. So the thing has become, it's like a fast food. You know, they have this set, uh -huh. yeah. But as long as they're singing and dancing and drinking, Love. people are happy. Yes. But they are come alone or just uh, brought by the travel agency. The yes. Yeah, yes. by the travel agency. By travel agents. But this phenomenon is getting less and less now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we the, the change policy after Xiao Ying as the president. So the Chinese government now, I think, is not that open for them to come to Taiwan. And, and, and some people now, they're back to say, okay, then we have to focus back to the other tourists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of them are tourists. Local people would then come. I only go to those restaurants when I have visitors. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't go. I only have my visitors, special visitor for them. I'll take them to the restaurant. And your students wouldn't go? Well? No, it's too expensive for them. Oh, okay. yeah. And then if they want to eat, we can barbecue ours. We can do that. <laughs> we can go fishing and barbecue. So why do we go to the restaurant? Yeah. And then if we going out for the food, then they don't want to go to indigenous restaurant. They want something, maybe Italian food. They want something different and special. Mm -hmm. If they can eat that at home, why they eat that in a restaurant and they pay like a ten times, right? Yeah. So it's maybe, and then even the owner themselves will say, we don't eat this food like this. We eat we maybe barbecue fish, then you can just like Doc was saying, like a big uh, oil tank, and then you put the fire, and then you just barbecue, and then we eat. We don't have that present beautifully. Yeah. So, and they probably use plastic bag. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay, so maybe we should uh, continue our discussion. Over. So we've got some coffee and some uh, desserts uh, to come. So let's thank uh, Joyce for two fantastic talks. Thank you.